So we're calling this series, Living in God's Ultimate Purpose. In the book of Ephesians, probably more than any other one thing, really, any other one book, really talks clearly about God's purpose. Now, we've been doing a series on Revelation two years worth. I still can't believe we did that. And many of us were really touched by it. Uh, we long for heaven. And we got a great idea in that series what heaven was like. But there is now. We're living here. Jesus is coming soon, but what do we do in the meantime? We had a great time studying what's going to happen in the future, but how do we live now in light of what many of us have learned over those two years? Well, John 17, 3 says, Now this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. The most important part of that is to realize eternal life does not begin when you die. For the Christian, it begins now. And interesting, says, interesting to see that Scripture says eternal life is having such a relationship with God that we know Him and we know His Son, Jesus Christ. And of course, that's by the work of the Holy Spirit. A great verse to remember as we begin a new year is Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. And as you write out your goals and think about what you want to try to accomplish this year, this verse says, this is what the Lord says, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. Now if you think about the average person you know, what's their focus going to be in 2014? One of or some combination of those three things. Education, uh, physical stamina and health, and, and wealth. Well scripture says none of those things are important to him. He says, let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and knows me. Now, there is a joke among men that says no man can understand a woman. Now, what's interesting about that is scripture, 1 Peter 3, 7, it says, if a husband does not live in an understanding way with his wife, God will not hear his prayer. So as far as God is concerned, uh, that phrase, no man can understand a woman, is not true. But a, a phrase that might be true is to say no one can truly understand God. Because if we did, we'd be God, don't you think? And yet at the same time, this verse says that the thing we should be boast about is that our understanding and knowing of God is what's really characteristic of us. And then it goes on to describe what kind of God he is. He says that I am the Lord... And the Lord means boss, one in charge, who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. So my question is, as you start 2014, is your focus, I want to know and understand God? Well, if you do, there is very few places that you can go better than the book of Ephesians, and so that's what we're going to to be studied. Now what I'm concerned about is that many Christians live as spiritual paupers. Interesting, in the LA Times there was a story about a 50-year-old couple who died of malnutrition. And yet upon their death, it was found that there was $40,000 found in a paper bag in their closet. I mean, you just think, how could somebody die of malnutrition when you have a bag of $40,000 in your closet. Uh, there was a lady named Hedda Green, and I did some research on Hedda. She's kind of a fascinating lady. She was born in 1834. Any of you know her? <laughs> <laughs> Our class is older, but we're not quite that old. But uh, interesting to read about her. She is in the Guinness World Book of Records, declared America's greatest miser. Isn't that an amazing thing to be known for? And that record holds from 1834. Um, at the age 15, she was uh, going to school and doing very well. Her father died in 1684, and, uh, and she inherited $7.5 million. Now, if you adjust that to today's dollar, it's $108.6 that she inherited at the age of 30. 
what was interesting, give you a little idea of this lady, when she heard that her aunt uh, Sylvia had been, uh, had willed the most of her million dollar estate to charity, she went to court to try to stop it. Because she didn't want this lady giving her money to charity. Uh, also found out that she was married and uh, she was real concerned that she wouldn't marry some man who only wanted her for her money. And so uh, this was kind of the first prenuptial agreement. She had him renounce all rights to her wealth when she he married her. And that was clear back in 1867. Now, her stinginess was legendary, the article says. She was said to never have turned the heat on and never used hot water. And I'm a little embarrassed to even say this to you, but I think it's fascinating. She wore one old dark dress and undergarments that she changed only after they'd been worn out. I don't give too much time thinking to that at my whole day. She never washed her hands and rode in an old chariot. She ate mostly pies that cost 15 cents. Uh, one tale, cl a tale claims that she spent half a night searching her carriage for a stop, a lost stamp worth two cents. Uh, another person said she instructed her laundress to wash only the dirtiest parts of her dress, that was the hem, to save money on soap. So this was a lady who was known as America's greatest pauper. Now my question is, as a Christian, are you like that? When I had my own elder care company, I had a client, and we got him just a couple of weeks before his death. And he told us that he had $5 million. Well, none of us believed it, because his house was in the worst condition I have ever seen a house in. Again, not to be too indelicate about the matter, but there was six inches of cat dung on his sink. So you get a little idea of the quality of life that he was living. He was ranking right up there with Hetty Green. But we found out he, in fact, had $5 million. Now, so much of that is true of the Christian. God has talked about, and we'll see this over these studies, the riches that are ours, but we live as paupers. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, God is able to make a little grace kind of dribble into you so that once in a while, having a few things you might need, you'll kind of stumble along in every good work, right? Now, we've done this with this verse before. For you who are visiting, I'm infamous for misreading Scripture on purpose. And the words all and abound are pretty significant in this verse. God is able to make how much? Aww. All grace. And I love this. Abound. What's abound? It just keeps coming and coming and coming abound to you. So that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. A couple of weeks from now, we're going to spend a whole day just talking about what grace is. And most of us have no clue about what grace is. 2 Corinthians 6.10 says, the Apostle Paul, recording the trials of his life, he says, I'm sorrowful, yet always rejoice, poor, yet making many rich, having nothing, yet possessing everything. And that's what God wants for us. He wants us to live out of the great riches that are ours in Christ. But so many Christians are what I like to call malnutritious. Much like this couple that died of malnutrition and they had money in the closet. Because we don't know how to live out of the glorious riches of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, it was interesting this morning, a lot of times I do service leading, and I kind of wish I would have done it today. Uh, the choir, and I, I would have brought this. The choir was singing, rain on me, rain on me. And as I was singing, I was thinking, ah, oh, parable. And you know kind of parable. I would have brought a sprinkling key. <laughs> and it would have had one of those little nozzles on it, you know, that just kind of looks like rain when you pour it. And I would have put a little bucket on the floor, and I would have come out and I would have said, most of you came this morning with your spiritual sprinkling bucket. And you put some stuff in it, and you put it on yourself, hoping that you'll be spiritual. And when the bucket is empty, you're empty. 
And that's the way I think most of us live. We live as if our lives depend on us, and we're a sprinkling bucket, and we hope a little bit rains on us once in a while. That song was saying the Holy Spirit should rain on us from his infinite supply. And that's what Scripture's talking about here, the glorious riches of Jesus Christ. And so in Ephesians 3, 16 to 19, and I don't know, a year from now, two years from now, we'll get to chapter 3. <laughs> he says, I pray that out of your glorious riches. Now, do you, do you know God like that? You know, I think most of us see God as stingy. I love very much a story that was told about this man who in a dream was thinking about asking God for help. And he said, I pictured myself driving under God's grain elevator. And you know what a grain elevator is? It's this huge stash of grain. And what you do is you pull your truck under it. And so he said, I pictured myself pulling my truck under the grain elevator that God had, praying, God, please, please give me something. And a little wind came by, and there were a couple of grains of wheat on the edge of the grain elevator, and they blow into my truck, and I drove off. And then the Lord said, if you would have just reached up and pulled the handle in prayer, I love this, God would have buried your truck. Isn't that a great story? Most of us are like that. Just a few little grains fall in, we're so satisfied when God wants to bury our truck. Out of his glorious riches, he might strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. We're going to see what that means. That's such a profound thing. But that's what this book is all about, living like that. And he goes on and he says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Now hear this, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Now I must admit to you, I haven't lived that way this weekend. We took down our Christmas tree. <laughs> and that is one of the saddest days of the year for me. I just hate Christmas to be over. And I've struggled with the emotions of it. Ruthie will tell you I've not been particularly nice to live with. I've been grumpy. Just kind of like that. And so I, I haven't even been asking the Lord to give me a couple of grains blowing off the thing. I let Satan rob my joy altogether that you might be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. you experience experiencing that? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at these days. We are embarking on a study of Ephesians that will help us to see how this prayer is answered, how God will, in fact, fill you to the fullness of the measure of who he is. Ephesians 1, 15 to 19, uh, Paul says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I've not stopped asking God, our, of the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he might give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you might know him better. And I pray also that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. Now, I knew that we were going to look at this verse, and I wanted to do it with Brenda, and I didn't get time. I don't know if you noticed, she was wearing her glasses on top of her hair. Did you see it? Yeah. See, they were like up here. And I wanted to come up and say, uh, Brenda, would you bend over? You see, that's the eyes of your mind. You see, right up there when you've got your glasses on top of your head. Well, that's what we're talking about here, is that God would enlighten you in order that you might know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and the incomparably great power for all of us who believe. Now, we're going to take this study very slow, and we're going to tear every one of those phrases apart. By the time we're done, two, three years from now, <laughs> these phrases are going to be really significant to you. But you know what I love about this at the beginning? Paul tells us what he's praying for. Now, one thing I really encourage you, there's a number of things we're going to hope to change this year, but one of them is when you tell somebody you're praying for them, tell them what you're asking the Lord for. So if, for example, I come and I say, Reggie, I've been praying for you, one of the things he should say, well, what are you asking the Lord for? I say, well, I've been praying that God would give you patience. And his answer would be, please stop praying. <laughs> you know how you get patience? Through trial. 
or I'm teasing a bit. But we need to be telling one another what we're praying about for one another. And then if somebody says they're praying for you, ask them. And Paul tells us. And we're going to see a number of his prayers in this book. But that's how he prays. Now let me just, by way of introduction today, give you just a quick overview of how the book runs out. It's six chapters. The first three, one to three, tell us what we are in Christ. And you're going to be absolutely enthralled about this. And I can guarantee you, even though you think you know this well, there'll be things you've seen, you will see that you've never seen before. And then in Ephesians chapter 4 to 6, he goes on to say, how do we live in light of who we are in Christ? So, I mean, it's a very practical book. Chapters 1 to 3 tell us what our riches in Christ are, and then 4 to 6, how do we spend those riches in Christ? So that's the simple structure of how it's laid out. Interesting, some of the key words that have come up in the book of Ephesians, the first one is grace, appears 12 times, we're going to want to spend a real clear time understanding that word. The word glory happens eight times. Inheritance, four. Riches, five. Fullness and filled, seven. In Christ, 27. I bet you'll never guess what the theme of the book of Ephesians is. <laughs> Living in Christ. All right, in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, he says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So you're going to find as we go through this book, words like fullness, riches, inheritance, blessings, out of us glorious riches are going to pop out all over the place. And so basically, this book is written us written for us to learn how to live between now and what we've been studying about where we're going to. It has great implications. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. It was he, that is God, the Father, who gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For what reasons did he give all those people? To prepare God's people for works of service so the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. And then he defines mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now one of the phrases the church has tagged on you as a group before I got here is that you are the mature adults. And that's not a bad phrase, especially if we take it in this light. So wouldn't it be exciting if in fact we were known as the group who was attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. <coughs> now, it would be fun to go around and take a poll of the church and say, all right, define for us what a mature adult is. And you know what most of the, the stupid people in the church would say? People who are 65 and above. Now, one of the things we talk about every once in a while, I am so concerned that the majority of us have such an unbiblical view of aging. And I don't have time to get into that today. But that's not God's definition of mature. It has nothing to do with age. He says, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So how's it going? How mature are we? Well, that's what we want to study. And I'm hoping by the time we're done, you're going to be much more mature than you are now. Ephesians 5.17, just to give you a little smatterings of where we're going. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk with thine instead, because that leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So again, the theme is going to be filling, riches, blessing, living out of the glorious riches of Christ. Well, let me give you just a few facts that will help us as we begin our study. First of all, the book was written as really a circular letter that probably went to all of the churches of Asia, but started out in the book of Ephesus, or the city of Ephesus located in modern Turkey. It was the greatest city of the area. Matter of fact, it was called the Light of, a uh, of Asia. You know what Los Angeles means? City of Angels. You should really file a suit because that's a lie. <laughs> Wouldn't it be true? Wouldn't it be neat if it was true that this was the City of Angels? At one point, I think it was for a football game on the team, but anyway. All right, so the city of light. 
the light of Asia. What a great uh, heritage they had. It had the greatest harbor in Asia Minor. It had four great roads that all came together in it. And that was such an amazing thing at that time in history because the roads would make or break you. Kind of like railroads did in early America. You know some of those stories? Where if you knew where the railroad was going and you could build your town there, it would be good. And if you misjudged, you'd probably lose out. Four great roads went into it. It was a free city, self-governing. That was unusual. And they had what we would call the Olympic Games. They called the Ephesus Games. And they were played and had the same impact the uh, Olympic Games have for us now. They had a massive theater where all of that took place. Some of you would know that that was the center of the worship of Diana, the fertility god. And her temple was one of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, still is to this day, matter of fact. It was, however, the center of idolatry of the very worst kind. In Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, it talks about Ephesus. We didn't look at this when we did our Revelation study, so it's fun to come back to it. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate with the men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered, have endured hardship for my name, and have not grown weary. Now, what a great list of things. Let's look at them real quickly. This church was founded by the Apostle Paul. The letter in Revelation 2 was written 40 years later. So really what you're finding in Revelation is kind of the 40th anniversary of the church at Ephesus and God's estimation of it. Now you've had a number of anniversaries here at Rolling Hills. I never can remember. How many years are we been in existence? 70? 60? 60 something? 60 something? 57, do you think? 57 this year? Year 57. Oh, it started in 1957. All right, so somebody who's good at math, it's not me. What is our, how many years now? 57. 46. I can smell the smoke. <laughs> so how many years? 64 years. We're not speaking with great Kate. 1957 to 2014. So we've got a soccer team already here. Don't you think we should have? All right, so anyway, we are older than the book of the, the church at Ephesus. We, got, we can say that with confidence, right? All right, so 40 years later, it was a strong, vital church born at a very unbelievable time and a very difficult place. A lot of bad things went on in Ephesus. It's interesting that John, who wrote the book of Revelation under the direction of the Holy Spirit, was the leading elder at Ephesus. Did you know that? And he was sent to the Isle of Patmos. Now here's some of the traits of this church. It says, I know your deeds and your hard work. This was a church that was busy about God's work. Secondly, he said, I know your perseverance. They were courageous, enduring the cost of faithfulness. Now, this one is really important, and I want us to take just a minute on this one, and I'm probably going to catch some of you off guard, so listen carefully. I know you cannot tolerate wicked men. Now, notice it doesn't say, I, I, you, I know you don't tolerate wickedness. It says wicked people. They uh, held very strongly to God's sand, standard and gave no place to the devil at all. Now there is a phrase, and I've taken it on numbers of places, and I've had people hate me because of it. I've been accused of all kinds of things because of it, but I'm going to say it again because it's true. Most people say God hates the sin but loves the sinner, and that is not true. Now listen carefully. Who does God send to help? Well, of course, the sin he sends to hell, right? No, it's the sinner who God sends to hell. Now, hear this carefully. I don't know how to say it any clearer than this. God hates sin so much, when it's unforgiven in the life of a person, God sends the sinner to hell. 
He hates the sinner. That's why he sent Jesus Christ, so that the blood of Jesus Christ can remove the sin from the sinner. You, you understand what I'm saying here? So this cliche, which is often true of spiritual cliches, misleads people. God hates sin so much when it's on a person, he is required to judge that person in hell. And we're going to look at that in detail as we go further in our study. So what has he done? He's made a way to remove the sin from the sinner so that he can love the repentant, forgiven sinner and send them to heaven. You understand that? Now, if you, if you want to take issue with this, and I've had people do it, I'll be upstairs afterwards, glad to talk with you about it. But I want you to make very clear God hates sinners because they are tainted with sin. Do you get this? All right, so if you have a question, come ask. I'll be as gentle with you as I can. <laughs> but Psalm 5.5 5 says, you hate all who do wrong. How much clearer could it be than that? Psalm 5.5, five, do you get it? You, who's the you? God, hate all who do wrong. God sends sinners to hell. He has to separate the sin from the sinner. We're going to talk about that in Ephesians on how we did that. One of my prayers is, if you're a Christian, you're going to have a much deeper appreciation for your salvation than you've ever had. All right, so he says, they do not tolerate wicked men. Revelation 21, 27 says, Nothing impure will enter it, heaven, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And who are those who have had their sins separated from them? Those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So 40 years after their founding, they're still hating evil and evil men in a godly way. Number four, they're characterized by biblical discernment. It says, you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. Boy, I wish that could be said of the modern day church. I'm just amazed at the people that are followed by so-called Christians. False teachers. They knew God's truth and how to make the right evaluation with it. And we'll talk at some length about that. Number five, commendation. They persevered and have due hardship for my name and have not grown weary. And that last phrase is really significant to me. They say true for 40 years for his name's sake, and they have not grown weary. You know one of the phrases that we hear among pastoral people across the nation these days? and it's not an unusual phrase to them, is that they, uh, they grow stale in the afternoon, they have uh, worn out, uh, well, I can't think of the phrase that's used right now, right on the tip of my tongue, and it's not there, I'm going to find it. Burnout, thank you, that's the way, that's the word I want. Burnout, and, and we talk about it all the time as if it is the most common thing that can happen in ministry. It should never happen in ministry. If we're living out of the incredible glorious riches of Christ, do you ever burn out? No. So why do we burn out? Because we're not living out of the glorious riches of Christ. So they were faithful to the Lord, and as a result of it, faithful to the word, faithful to the work, and faithful to the Lord, God says they didn't burn out. They were faithful in biblical discernment, and they had not grown weary, and they did it for his name's sake. And then the sixth thing it says, they hate the practice of the Nickelodeons. And these were people, I'm not going to get into it today, who were false teachers and they were leading people astray. In a summary, this was a great church. Wouldn't you have liked to have had that evaluation from God about Rolling Hills Covenant? That's pretty neat, don't you think? But notice what he said. Yet I have this against you, this great church. You have forsaken your first love. The Christian's danger is that our love for God grows cold. And I must tell you that as pastor to mature adults, to senior adults, or my biblical term, the elders of the church, 
is that we can grow cold on our love for God. We've lost our wonder, been there, done that, heard the sermon, taken communion, done it all. Our love for God has grown at least apathetic, yet not cold altogether. Matthew 9, 37, 38. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And i got to tell you, that hits awfully close to home for me. Part of what I've been wrestling with this week is my, my kids were with us for a whole week. And it's taken me a good week to get over them not being here. I love being with my children. Even this morning, I turned to Ruthie and said, do you realize that last Sunday our kids were sitting with us in church? And I can't tell you how hard it is for me when they're not. And, and the Lord's had to challenge me about this numbers of times to say, God, or John, do you love your children more than me? And he who has done not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. The simplest definition of a Christian is one who profoundly loves God. Now, I want to use that very carefully because if we misunderstand it, we're going to get misled here. Because you're going to find all kinds of people out on their street say, well, yeah, of course I love God. But notice what John 4.21 says. He who has my commands and keeps them, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and disclose myself to him. So the measure of our love for God has to do with our obedience. John 21, 15 to 17, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon Peter, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, well, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, well, then take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, if you remember, Peter denied the Lord three times. 2 Corinthians 16, 22. If anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. So at the heart of being a Christian is that we have a profound, all-encompassing love for God. And so scripture says over and over again, love the Lord your God as far as it is convenient. No, it says with what? There's another one of those nasty little word alls again. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. For so many Christians, our life is about God giving me what I want and what I need. Biblically, being a Christian is my loving him singularly. That's a hard word for me to say. Thank you. Supremely. Sacrificially. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15, for Christ's love, I like this, compels us, drives us forward. Because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but him who died for them and was raised again. So in Ephesians 6, 24, he kind of sums it all up. Grace to all who love the Lord Jesus Christ with undying love. And this was a problem the Ephesians had. Their love for God, their fervent love for God had been dying. John 16, 27. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me. So the evidence of, of their growing love for God, if we have it, is shown by these characteristics. We have new desires for God, not just new duties. We want to obey his commands. We have new delights, not just new deeds. So we don't just do things that God wants us to do. We really delight in them. We have new treasures, not just new tasks. And then I love one this the most, that Christ is cherished. He's not just chosen. So for the person who truly loves God, it talks about desires, delight, treasures, and cherishing. So what do you do when you've lost your first love? Well, Revelation tells us. Revelation 2.5, remember the height for which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. So one of the themes of Ephesians will be 
the wonder of our salvation. And he says the first secret to keeping your first love is that you remember. This is a fascinating verse in Psalm 88, verse 12. It says, righteousness cannot be done in a land of forgetfulness. But the key to living a growing love of God is to remember what he's done. And we're going to look at this in detail and, and see things I think probably you've not ever seen before on what God had to do to save us. And to reflect on what he's promised and reestablish from those two truths what he wants to do in the present. So I remember what he's done. I reflect on what he's promised. I can therefore live in the present. There is a real holy dissatisfaction with anything less than God's fullness. Having recognized that, then we repent. We confess that we have placed something else as our first love. We confess that that is idolatry and seek God's forgiveness and cleansing. And then we repeat what we've done before, he says. Do the deeds you did at first. What was it like to walk with God in victory, joy, and refreshment? And how do we get back to it? The person who's growing in their love of God has a vital relationship with Christ where God is speaking to us through his word. We are speaking to him in prayer and we're speaking about him to one another. He is a part of our conversation all the time. So Ephesians 5, 19, 20 says, speak to one another with grumblings and complainings and political phrases. <laughs> now what does he say? Speak to one another in hymns and songs and spiritual songs, singing and music in your heart to the Lord. Here's another one of those words, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Do you realize how important it is to be connected with the body of Christ so that your love of God will flourish? We'll talk about that. It's a major theme of the book of Ephesians. Now, there is a fearful warning here. Revelation 2.5. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Matthew 7, 21, 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and did we not drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles? Then he will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me. So the question is, are we like the Ephesians? good in so many traits, but we've lost our first love. And Revelation 2, 7 ends with this phrase, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Well, in Malachi, we've looked at this, God draws this incredible distinction from the believers and the unbelievers and he talks to the people of God and he says, Malachi 1, 2, I have loved you, says the Lord. And the people's response is, how? You haven't loved us. Are you experiencing living in the love of God? Well, there's a new group called Greater Vision. I love this group. You'll hear a lot of them this next year. But I want to have you hit, listen to them today. Uh, and I love this. So follow the words because it really talks about what we're doing. Why do I love God? You may ask me. What do I? 
there are some things that God requires. But we'll talk a lot about that as we study the book of Ephesians in terms of what God had to do before you could even respond in repentance and faith. So the phrase as it stands really fits the book of Ephesians, but we've got to look at it and see what it understands. So my question today is, how's your love for God? Is it like the Ephesians, growing cold? Or is it growing warmer, more exciting? I shared with you one of the traits that people gave to me when I was leading in CASA that I've always embraced and loved. As I was talking a lot about how we as older believers should not lose our wonder. And this was at a, one of the retreats that we were leading. And I had done a lot of this. And one of the ladies came up to me and said, John, I've got a new name for you. I'm going to call you Wonder Boy. <laughs> and I absolutely loved that phrase. That was one of the highest compliments I ever got. And I want people to look at us and say, there's a wonder group that we're so in love with God. We're so aware of the incredible, glorious riches that are ours in Christ that we're abounding in every moment 
every situation, every good work. And I, I tell you, we're in for a great ride. And this is going to be a great experience for us as we look at the book of Ephesians and a great thing to follow now, our study of the book of Revelation. So let me pray, and like I say, if you have any questions, I'll be up in the Welcome Center a little bit. <coughs> Father, I thank you that you wrote the book of Ephesians. It is my favorite New Testament book. And I'm really looking forward to go through it together as a class. I know at least where we're headed in the next few weeks, and I'm, I'm very excited about what we're going to look at. And yet today there is both a joy and a concern. Lord, thank you for the wonderful things you said about the book, uh, the, the church of Ephesus. And yet that indictment at the end, whoa, you lost your first love. I pray as we evaluate kind of the last year and look into the new one, that we'd say, Lord, is there any possibility that could be true of me? And I pray that as we begin this study, that our love for you would grow in ways that we would never even imagine. Help us to understand how much you love us. Requiring nothing yet, giving everything. Blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I pray that as we begin this study now together this, this year, that we will see things we've never understood before. That we'll realize what a wonder it is that we are your children. And because of that, our love for you would grow in ways that, that we wouldn't even imagine today. So I pray that as we leave uh, today, that you'd help us to begin that journey. And I ask these things in Jesus' name.